Hello pilots and welcome back to Flying with Overkill F-18C Hornet and today we're going to be continuing our radar tutorial by talking about TWS or TWIS. First, I still want to preface that if you do not understand how radar works, please stop this video and check the three links down in the description below for a very detailed three-part tutorial series on the F-15's um, uh, radar for DCS World. Now, it's not just strictly to the F-15. It goes into significant detail about how radar works, how it sees, what its weaknesses are, where its blind spots are. This is all important information to know before using any aircraft's radar, so that way you understand how to manipulate your aircraft and the radar to maintain good situational awareness. For everybody else, let's go ahead and continue on. So, first thing we're doing is going to go ahead and come on down here. Actually, let's go ahead and put us into air-to-air -air mode. <coughs> Let's select our AMRAM, and we can see our we have six on board, and then let's go ahead and lock up our screen here. And first, let's talk about a few things. So the first thing I want to talk about is let's go over strengths and weaknesses so you understand where the advantages come between the two. Range wall search that we're in right now by default mode is very nice for being able to get a very large picture of the battle area. Um, as well as maintaining a very very strong lock on a target not impervious it's not foolproof obviously there are ways to defend against a single target track but it is much more difficult and requires much more work on the hostile pilot now single target track when we lock a target 100 percent of our aircraft's energy goes into or radar energy goes into keeping track of that target which means the hostile aircraft his rwr is now going crazy letting him know that hey someone's locking you you're very likely to be fired on therefore he goes into a defensive position or maybe fires on you first whatever it may be okay the other problem with single target track is we lose all visibility of the rest of the sky all right now track wall scan Track while scanned, we get a very limited field of view, okay? We do not get the 140 degrees azimuth that we get here. We cannot go into six bars with 140 degree azimuth where we're getting a very thorough search of the entire 140 degrees. What we get is more restricted based on the number of bars. So however number of bars we have will determine what our uh, azimuth is. More bars, less azimuth, less azimuth, or more azimuth, less bars. Okay, so we'll go into that in a minute. Now here's the cool part about TWS. When we bug a track file or a target, however you want to identify them, when we bug them, I'm not going to call it locking, I'm going to call it bugging them. Okay, we're sort of just tapping them. We're telling the computer or radar to focus on these two. There's two, we can have a primary and a secondary. Okay, when we bug those primary and secondaries, there, the hostile's RWR is not going off. It has not changed. All it knows is that there's an F-18 out there with its radar on. That's it, that's all it knows. Okay, so that's a pretty big advantage. Even when we fire the missile, in our case, the AMRAM, it is important to remember TWS really shines when used with the AIM-120. Okay, and the reason being is because the AIM-120 has its own onboard radar. So how this happens is if we're outside of pitbull range, and remember pitbull is when the onboard radar for the AMRAM goes active, it no longer requires anything from us as the, as the pilot. We can turn and run once it goes active, and we call that pitbull. Okay, so if we fire two missiles, one missile, whatever, at a target, okay, before the missile goes pit bull, we are still guiding that missile to the target, but again, the hostile's RWR has no idea that we've launched a missile at them. Now, when the missile goes pit bull, his RWR is going to scream, but by then, he can have anywhere between 12 and 2 seconds to react to that. So, you know, there's a lot of advantage there. There may not be a lot of reaction time, you know, before he gets splashed. Disadvantages. One of the things that the TWS does, and this is my understanding of it, and if I'm wrong, you know, forgive me, but I think I, I think I still got the basic gist of it, is it takes the target aircraft, so, back up, it takes all the other surrounding aircraft, all the aircraft that's within its field of view, it takes their current telemetry information, their speed, their course, their altitude, etc., and until the radar sweep actually hits their aircraft again, what it does is predicts where they are. Okay, obviously pretty logical um, prediction, not just you know some random guess, but use that information to predict where they are. Here's the disadvantage to that. If in that prediction display, okay, so the radar sweep isn't actually 100% sure that's where they are, it's one of those contacts where it's guessing, okay, in that pre during that prediction time, if that track file makes any very aggressive evasive maneuvers, you know, dives down really quickly, changes altitude real fast, makes a hard turn, accelerates, um, the information that we see on the radar display scope 
may not be correct. And Chuck said it best in, in his guide when I was reading this a long time ago. Um, and I think it was something to the effect of, you know, this is a situation where the hunter can quickly become the hunted. I love that quote. Plus, it just sounds cool to say it. Um, but it's very accurate because you'll think that you have a track file here where they may be in a completely different situ or location and they may be tracking you. Okay, and therefore they can get in close before you even realize it's happened. Okay, so again, a couple disadvantages. The other thing is it's much, much easier for the hostiles to break that radar lock. Okay, all they have to do is really get out of your, what could be a very limited field of view on your azimuth, and radar lock's gone. Okay, so let's go ahead and switch into TWS. Now, the other thing we want to do is um, go to our data screen. We're going to disable LTWIS. We're going to disable the data link. All right, let's get back into our main menu. Now, let's talk about the azimuth restrictions. So you can see we're at 20 degrees and we're at 6 bars. And that's because we were at 6 bars when I went into TWS from range while search. So I can hit this azimuth button as much as I want. 20 degrees is all I'm getting. Now I can move my TDC around and wherever the center of the TDC is, is going to be the center of the azimuth scan. Okay, now this is very effective if you know where somebody is. If you know where there's an aircraft, you can use this and get a very, very thorough scan of the sky in their area and just sort of follow them around, right? It requires more work on the pilot to maintain that lock, but it's an option. Now, if we go down to two bar, well, then we get a few more options, 20, 40, 60, and 80, right? But getting a two bar scan, and remember what the bars are. Our azimuth is how far am I looking from left to right? Our bars is how well am I looking up and down. So with a two bar, you're getting a much wider field of view, but I'm not looking very hard. Okay. 20 degree field of view. Okay. We can go to, let's say a four bar scan, right? And we get 20 and 40. So at 40 degrees now, I'm looking at a little bit more of the sky, but I'm doing a better job looking at it. And then finally, like we just talked about, if we go into six bar, I'm looking at a very, very small piece of sky, but I'm doing a very, very good job looking to make sure that, you know, I do my best to find your targets, right? So I hope that makes sense on how that works. So let's go ahead and let's go to four bar. All right, and now let's talk about a few things that are kind of cool. Let's bring an aircraft up. I'm going to come up to 80 miles here. And let's go ahead and bring our first group up. All right. So we have our first group up. Now you can sort of see, let's zoom in a little bit further. You can sort of see here that we've got what looks like three aircraft here. Oh, it looks like one of them disappeared. And why is because, this is what I was talking about. Okay. I moved my TDC. And so now the azimuth can't see them. So if we come back over here, now we've got them back. Okay. And if you guys watch, you can sort of see a warning that it's about to happen. So if we move back over here again, watch they'll fade. Oh, that time he just disappeared. Anyway, usually you'll see them turn. They, they may not have because I was right on top of them. But usually you'll turn. You see them turn a slighter, brighter yellow. Okay. Now, they're pretty hard to see right now. Okay, it's pretty hard to determine really how many aircraft are here, and you have two options to solve that. And I'm going to do my best to explain these two. I don't know that I still fully understand how it works. Okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to hit this raid button. Now, for all of you who are wondering, if you've ever set up your controls for your field of view button, you'll see raid slash field of view. Okay, that's what this is. Okay, raid is a completely different radar mode. Okay, and I'm going to read you a, an excerpt straight out of Chuck's tutorial guide and hope that it makes sense to you guys. In scan raid, the radar commands a special 20 deg 22 degrees azimuth, three bar scan centered on the LNS. I'll talk about the LNS as here in a second, but it's one of the aircraft once we deem it so. Doing what is called raid assessment, the radar will attempt to detect multiple targets out of what it thought was a single target. This Doppler grouping effect can occur when targets are in extremely close proximity and have the same closure rate. Scan raid is purpose to combat this. Okay, so the idea behind it is if you get an, a group of aircraft that are so close together that the radar is deeming them as a single target. Okay, they're only appearing as a single target, but in fact, there's multiple there. Okay, by hitting the raid, okay, it's going to change the way the radar is scanning. Okay, at a 22 degrees um, display, so we're only at 22 degrees of azimuth at 10 nautical miles centered on our LNS. Okay, now let's make an LNS and talk about what that is for a second. 
So first, I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to pick one of these, and I'm going to hit my target designate. All right. So you can see a couple things come up. First, we get our steering cue. Here's our steering dot for the AMRAM. All right, but the more important thing I want you guys to focus on is a star. The star is our LNS, okay? And what that stands for is launch and steering for the primary target. When we designate a secondary target, it will have a diamond on it, and that is called our DT2, or secondary target, and we'll look at that in just a minute. Okay, now some of the things that have popped up here on the screen. We have our missile range queue. So here's our R maximum, here's our turn no escape, and here's the R min. Okay, and then of course, like I said, we get our steering queue in our, our guidance circle. All right, now let's go ahead and unpause, and I'm gonna hit this raid button. Okay, oops, I changed azimuth, there we go, or uh, scan range. So I'm going to hit our rate button, and now look what happens. Notice that the azimuth bar stopped moving. Now, I'm paused right now, but I can promise it's not moving right now. Okay, you can see our star indicating our LNS, so this is our primary target. So what the radar has done is it's focused on the center of this aircraft, okay, and then tries to use a 22 degree sweep okay from the center of this aircraft to see if there's any other aircraft around it so raid is a way to basically determine if there are multiple targets within a single zone okay or, or surrounding a single target is the best way that i can describe it now there's one more um method that's sort of and this is where even i get a little confused and that's called exp or tws expand mode okay and this provides a zoomed in view of the tactical region centered around the LNS track file, but no change to the scan is made. Okay. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. So if we unpause, come out of RAID, and then go to the EXP. Okay. You can see that the scan still follows your TDC. Okay, we come back. There we go. All right, but it zooms in on them. It's essentially what it does. That's the easiest way to describe it. So EXP is more of a zoom centering the TDC focus uh, or centering on the TDC as a focus. Okay, and the RAID actually changes the way the radar is working. The radar is actually focusing on your LNS. Now, while we're here, let's designate our LNS again. So there's our LNS, okay, our launch and steering. And then now we're going to designate a DT2. So now what we get is you can see we have our LNS and we have a diamond indicating our secondary target. And we also get our uh, missile range cues up here on the display scope as well. So we have again our R maximum, our turn no escape, and our R min. Okay, so just like we saw before. Now let's say we want to swap these two, which we will have to do eventually, and I'll show you that in a minute. If we want to swap them, all we simply do is hit our nose wheel steering button, our target undesignate button. And now they've swapped. Alright, so we have now our DT2 up here, and our primary is now the middle aircraft. Alright, so a couple of really cool things there. Now, the other thing you can do is what I just did there, is I just made this wind a single target track by hitting my sensor select right Okay, you can, a little tip there, you can use your sensor select right button when you're on the radar to target designate, or you can use your target designate button as you have been. So kind of a neat little feature, uh, tip I figured I'd show you guys. All right, but now we need to redesignate our DT2. Now the other thing is, once you have your LNS and your DT2, you automatically get your telemetry information um, from them, whether you're slewed over them or not. So we can see they're at 0.6 Mach at 30,000 feet. But in order to get this last guy, okay, and the reason why he's got the num number one is he's now the primary track outside of the um, LNS and DT2. He's now our next focal point, okay, the next deemed priority. And by the way, you can have up to 10 tracks on the display at any time that have a hafu. Okay, anything more than 10 will be considered a hit, and they're going to show up as just that little green rectangular box that we see in RWS mode in range wall search. Okay, so let's go ahead and unpause, and they'll only show up if you have hits selected. If you unbox hits, they won't be there at all. All right, so if we want to find out our primaries information, we can still slew our TDC over, and now we get all three. Okay, but the second we move our slew, we still only get the LNS and the DT2. So now let's go ahead and come up top 
let's get out of the EXP mode. Okay, and let's just scan down a bit. So now we have their scan range here. They're passing into 30 miles, so we're getting close to firing range. So let's go ahead and come up here now, and let's pause again. So now that we're up top, you can see that we have our DT2 indicated by this X, and our primary with the steering circle indicated by the square. Now if we swap them, okay, hit my target designate button, you can see that now the information has changed, and we're going to have to make sure that we do this um, once we're ready to fire on both. So you can see that we have the shoot cue come up. You can see the range circle indicates they've passed through the R max range. So now let's go ahead and launch on this first one. So Fox 3. And so now we have 18 seconds until the missile goes active or pit bolt. Okay, this means that for 18 seconds we must keep these aircraft inside our limited field of view here on the uh, HUD or on the radar. And another thing on the radar I don't think I've shown you guys before is if you look at this triangle, this is an indication of the missile's position in relationship to the target. Okay, so you can sort of track it there as well to get an idea on how close the missile is to your bandit. Alright, so you get the range cue here. We have our 11 seconds to active. And right now on his RWR, all he knows, even though we've fired a missile, all he knows right now is that we are an F-18 with our radar on. But once the missile goes active, there we go. Okay, so now you can see the missile's gone active. We have a time tail target. This means the missile here has gone pit bull. And if you zoom in closely, you also get an A right underneath the missile indicating that the missile is now active. Okay. So now his RWR is screaming at him, letting him know there's a missile, but he's getting, what, he maybe got eight, nine seconds warning, okay? So unpause, and now if we want to fire on the second aircraft, we're just going to hit our target designate button, we've switched priority, box three, and now we have a new time tail active. Maintaining radar lock on both. And so there's the first aircraft that was just hit. We have nine seconds till the second one hits. And there's our splash again. Okay. So that is TWS in a ham basket, guys. There really isn't a ton to it. It's just more or less a different way of maneuvering and understanding how to keep your lock in your tracks. So if we wanted to come down, for example, let's just engage this guy real quick. He's in super close, so we're just going to turn in here. Like this guy here, he has no idea that we're locking him. Oops, I just foxed on him. Anyway, at that range, he never would have had any warning other than the missile going pit bull. So he would have no idea that we had locked him up. He would have no idea that we fired the missile until the missile went active, which honestly the missile would have gone active right off the rails. But I hope you guys are enjoying these tutorial series. Um, the next one, we will actually probably talk about the data link and the SA page. And then once those two are done, we will talk about the radar in its full entirety using LTWIZ and the data link. So we'll go latent trackwall scan and the data link pod um, after we discuss data link and situational awareness page. So um, anyway, as usual guys, Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, leave any questions, comments below, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.